Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Game of Thrones Season 1, Episode 3, Lord Snow. The episode in which Ned Stark arrives at King's Landing and pisses off everyone, while Jon does the same at the Wall. And we get fascinating introductions to some of the best characters of the series. And although this is one of the only episodes of Game of Thrones with zero deaths, it does give us this satisfying shut-up of Varys. I don't take orders from savages or their sluts. Do you hear me? <laughs> Now, if you're new to this series, I'm re-watching every episode of Game of Thrones in the first season, analyzing the missable ways these old episodes foreshadow and connect the later seasons that this channel has already broken down. Now, I would say episode three is the first episode of the series to truly diverge from the A Song of Ice and Fire books. Many of these scenes were original creations for the show. So, what was changed? Well, in the books, there is actually no version of the scene that we see in the opening minutes of the episode between Ned and Jamie at the foot of the Iron Throne, one of my favorite moments in the whole series. And even though it's not in the book, it does reference many things from the literary back Backstory. Must be strange for you coming into this room. Now, of course, Jamie's referring to this being the location of the killing of Ned's father and brother, but this also alludes to their past standoff during the sack of King's Landing. When Ned arrived at the Red Keep, he famously found the Kingslayer, having just killed the Mad King, sitting on the Iron Throne, and he stared him down until he got off the throne. So this time, Jamie sitting on the steps echoes this past tension. Glad to see you're protecting the throne. Now, another scene not in the books is this one between Cersei and Joffrey. Notice Joffrey's line here. You're a warrior, like your father. I'm not like him. I didn't fight off anything, it bit me, and all I did was scream. Huh, now this was a small moment, but it's really the only time I can remember Joffrey appearing at all likable. An actual human being who I almost feel sympathy for. No, no, not gonna happen. Can we roll the clip again? <laughs> Still, it's interesting that Cersei distorts the truth, corrupting her son into seeing a false version of the world. So really, this scene is reframing Joffrey as less of a born-this-way monster and more of a victim of his mother's psychotic worldview. We saw another adapted parent-child moment between Ned and Arya, but in this case, they left something out from the books. In the books, Ned shares this poetic insight. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. I don't know, maybe the writers felt this metaphor was too flowery for Ned on the show, but it becomes a key concept that keeps coming back to the book version of Arya again and again in her journey. Later on, she judges this lesson cynically, realizing that in her case, the lone wolf actually survived. Another book reference came from Old Nan and Bran. I could tell you about Sir Duncan the Tall. Those were always your favorites. Well, in the book, Sir Duncan the Tall was a hedge knight and the subject of George R. R. Martin's three Duncan Egg novellas. By the way, the egg of that story was his squire, the young prince Aegon Targaryen, later Aegon V, grandfather to the Mad King. Dunk actually visited Winterfell in one of his adventures, and it's believed he met Old Nan in her youth. Nice. This episode also gives us another twist in the mystery of who owns a Valyrian steel cat's paw dagger. Littlefinger lies, saying that he lost it in a bet to Tyrion in order to frame Tyrion and start a conflict between the Starks and Lannisters. In the books, this mystery is wrapped up more discreetly in later books, as Tyrion and Jaime each deduce that Joffrey must have stolen the dagger from Robert's armory and hired the assassin in order to impress his father, which, yeah, was kind of weird. So I was actually happy with how the show gave this dagger more of a smoking gun relevance in later seasons. Other non-book scenes written for the show included this one with Cersei and Jaime, and a later one with Jorah, Rakuro, and Eri. And while some of these scenes were just added to pad out episode screen time, some of the best writing on Game of Thrones came from these scenes. The one that comes to my mind was this one, with Robert drunkenly recalling first kills along with Barristan Selmy and Jamie. Notice Mark Addy's impressive tonal shift from near regret to killing Tarly Boy to rage at his current life. He could have lingered on the edge of the battle with the smart boys, and today his wife would be making him miserable, his sons would be ingrates, and he'd be waking three times in the night to piss into a bowl of wine! <laughs> so great. This reveals Robert's inner desire for a climactic, glorious death on a battlefield, like the one he delivered Rhaegar Targaryen, as opposed to his current slow march to death as he grows old on a throne. Also in the scene, Jaime gives us this key reveal of the Mad King's final words. He said the same thing he'd been saying for hours. Burn them all. This foreshadows Jamie opening up about this moment in season three, defending his choice as a heroic one. Burn them all, he said. If your precious Randy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women, and children burned alive, would you have done it? 
Now before I spoil too much of future episodes of this show, because apparently some of you are watching this series for the first time, I'll let you skip to this time to avoid any more discussion of later episodes. Peace for the rest of you guys. Let's dive into these sneaky foreshadowing moments in our segment, in hindsight. Okay, so back in that scene with Cersei and Joffrey, she tells her son this. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. These words define Cersei as a shrewd yet paranoid tactician, and they echo recently with Jamie in season seven. Enemies everywhere were surrounded by traitors. We also get a clever glimpse at Arya's murderous future in the immediate next shot, with Arya stabbing the dinner table, practicing, she says, for Joffrey. Notice how in all the scenes that Arya speaks in this episode, she's holding a different weapon. And then coming back to this Ned and Arya moment, in hindsight, this Stark Sticks Together idea comes full circle in the recent season seven finale, with Sansa quoting the exact dialogue that Ned spoke in the book. Father. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. I also love this line from Old Nan. Don't listen to it. Crows are all liars. Calling a crow a liar is, for one, hilarious, but also it foreshadows Bran's doubt toward the messages of the Three-Eyed Raven, who is called the Three-Eyed Crow in the books. Let's face it, this old crow's words are definitely manipulative and deceptive in their vagueness. Like he tells Bran that he will fly, but will he literally fly? I don't know, maybe Old Dan was right here, that Bran shouldn't take literally the words of old men who live in trees. And notice Rob's skepticism here. One time she told me, the sky is blue because we live inside the eye of a blue-eyed giant named Macumba. Now there could be a connection here to one of the opening shots of season seven when a giant white in the Army of the Dead marched toward Bran with his big blue eye coming into that close up. Either way, this vision is exactly the ghost story Old Nan warned Bran about, come to life. Rob joking about it here signals that he is not really prepared for that winter. Another parallel here, notice how Ned thanks Littlefinger for bringing him to his wife. You're a funny man. This same choke slam will be repeated against Littlefinger by John when Littlefinger brings up Catelyn in season seven. I love Sansa as I loved her mother. <laughs> Actually, this parallel between Ned and John is happening all over this episode. And I'll get to the deeper meaning of that later. Then notice what Jamie says to Cersei. Let me go. The boy won't talk. And if he does, I'll kill him. Him? Let's start the king, the whole bloody lot of them, until you and I are the only people left in this world. Jamie's whole, it's the two of us against the world, baby, philosophy will actually come back to haunt him in season seven, when Cersei uses this philosophy as a rationale to forget about their dead kids. With the last Lannisters, the last ones you count. And the fact that this now disgusts Jamie just shows how much his character has changed over this series. There's another more subtle connection to season seven from Benjamin Stark. Benjamin. You know, my brother once told me that nothing someone says before the word but really counts. Like the pack survives quote, we never really hear Ned actually say this, but John also quotes this to Sansa in the season seven premiere. They respect you, they really do, but you have to... Why are you laughing? What did father used to say? Everything before the word but is horse shit. And later notice the fight choreography of Arya's sparring with Sirio Forel. Dead? <laughs> oh. Dead. Very dead. These lunges and poses parallel Arya's later sparring with Brienne in Winterfell in the middle of season seven, with Brienne doing the same two-handed night stance and Arya doing the one-handed water dance. <laughs> And there's this haunting line from Maester Aemon. When winter does come, gods help us all if we're not ready. Notice how the editing immediately cuts to a shot of Danny's three dragon eggs with Viserion's cream-colored egg front and center. Now, I'm not sure if this was intentional or not, because who knows if Benioff and Weiss intended on the resurrected Viserion ridden by the Night King being the one to torch the wall, but it's a fun connection to think about. Also, this ghost story warning from Maester Aemon is parallel to the ghost story we heard from the other elderly figure of this episode, Old Nan. Let's actually go through all the other interesting continuity parallels and callbacks in this episode in our segment, Callbacks! Okay, so early in this episode, Ned gives his daughter 
Sansa a doll. Naturally, she's a huge asshole about it and whines that she hasn't played with dolls since she was eight, but I think this gift parallels the one Catelyn made for Bran in episode two. You know, the one made out of twigs and garbage. In both cases, these Stark parents are futilely attempting to comfort their children with handmade toys that aren't really useful to them. As well-meaning as these parental figures are, they don't really know what their children need. Later in the episode, Danny discusses Dothraki's slavery with Jorah, hinting that she finds the practice barbaric. Now, this is a callback to Viserys at the beginning of episode two, who told Jorah that he considered Westeros' ban on slavery nonsense. Under my reign, you won't be punished for such nonsense. So notice how we're already seeing the contrast in compassion between these two Targaryen siblings. And then Tyrion's goodbye to Jon at the Wall includes this great callback, with Tyrion fulfilling a promise he made to his niece and nephew last episode. No, I just want to stand on top of the wall and piss off the edge of the world. <laughs> okay, let's move on to some of the subtle sound and music choices in this episode in our section. Hear that? Okay, when Ned meets Arya in her chamber, listen closely to the noise that we hear in the background. Ah, I hear that. The chimes in the background are church bells coming from the Sept of Baylor. Those same bells toll later this season, signaling to Arya that her father's trial is about to begin. So the bells here in this scene foreshadow Ned's fate. Now this episode uses a similar device again later, but first I want to talk about some key music cues. We talked about how Ned's talk with Arya is a key Stark pack survives moment, and composer Ramin Jawadi emphasizes that by playing the Stark theme here. Kill the butchers, boy. I hate them. And then immediately after this, Old Man's ghost story is totally terrifying, but a big part of that is the return of Jawadi's White Walker theme, mixed in quietly under her words. Thousands of years ago, there came a night that lasted a generation. Kings froze to death in their castles, same as the shepherds in their huts and women smothered their babies rather than see them starve. But coming back to this foreshadowing with Ned, listen closely to the closing shots of the episode. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Ah uh, yes, Ned begins to hear the clacking of the wooden swords as the clangs of metal swords. And when Sirio gently pokes Arya, <laughs> ugh, the sound of flesh impaled. For Ned, this is another example of winter is coming. He knows that before long, this sword play will transform from a game to a matter of life and death. And before I get to the deeper meaning of all this, there were a few other details of this episode that I noticed in the background. So let's go over them in our segment. Zoom in and hands. Okay, back in that opening scene in the Red Keep, let's zoom and enhance on the window behind the Iron Throne. Notice how in season one, the window doesn't contain the red seven-pointed star that it does in later seasons. Instead, it's a stained glass depiction of a stag, the symbol of House Baratheon. This image reflects Robert's reign. He wasn't much of a religious man. In fact, his rebellion and usurping of the Iron Throne went against the religious authority, who sanctioned the Targaryens as a rightful monarchs. Now, later in the series, Joffrey's reign will be accompanied by the installation of a seven-pointed star window, representing in Cersei's attempt to use that divine authority to legitimize her son. But of course, later on, after Cersei's troubles with the Faith, she'll replace that star with her own Lannister lion. In the next scene, let's look at Robert's royal decree for an expensive tournament. Ned reads off these expenses. 40,000 gold dragons to the champion, 20,000 to the runner-up, 20,000 to the winning archer. Pycelle adds those up to 80,000 and asks Littlefinger if the crown could bear the cost, but zoom and enhance on that scroll. Look at the bottom there. Ned left off another 20,000 gold dragons for combat with swords and clubs, so the total cost should be 100,000. Why does Ned leave off this last line item? My guess is Ned never even considered this costly tourney a real possibility. Him going through all these details would just be a waste of time. This is yet another example of Ned's naivete coming in as Hand of the King. Later this episode, notice the Dothraki word that Danny is trying to pronounce. At Jaka, At Jahaka, At Jahaka. In Dothraki, At Jahakar translates to pride. The term is derived from the Doth word Jahak, the name of the long braid worn by Dothraki warriors that they only cut if they ever lose in battle. It's a physical symbol of their pride. And look closely at what Daenerys is doing here. She's having her hair braided, forming her own Jahak. And this happens right after she won her first victory, deflating the pride of her cruel brother Viserys. One of my favorite missable details from the whole series is that Danny's Jahak, season after season, becomes long 
longer and more complex. And it all starts in this moment. Okay, let's move on to the deeper meaning of this episode. Daenerys is successfully adapting to her surroundings, but she's not the only one to go through that kind of transition this episode. The title, Lord Snow, is actually taken from a character we haven't really talked about in this video yet, Jon Snow. Well, Lord Snow, it appears you're the least useless person here. Lord Snow is, of course, Thorne's mocking nickname for Jon, a proud newcomer who's too frosty to make allies. He talks down to and alienates all of his fellow Night's Watch recruits immediately. But as I said before, this episode is comparing Jon to another Lord Snow, Ned Stark. In his first few minutes of arriving in the capital, Ned immediately dismisses Varys, he mocks Littlefinger to losing to his brother Brandon in a duel, and he implies that Pycelle is disloyal. Come on, Ned, that's way too frosty. In the books, Littlefinger actually calls out Ned's icy demeanor, joking that Starks are made of ice and melt below the neck, and Ned coolly responds that he doesn't plan on melting anytime soon. And then in this episode, Littlefinger sums up the Starks with this line. Ah, oh, the Starks. Quick tempers, slow minds. And I like how the editing immediately jumps to the other Lord Snow after this line. Even though Jon and Ned are both frosty men, bitter over being misled into coming to this rotten dead end, Jon, after heeding the wisdom of Benjamin and Tyrion, learns to adapt to his new surroundings. By the end of the episode, he helps his brothers rather than talking down to them and beating the crap out of them. Making more enemies than allies will always be a struggle for Jon throughout the series, but he at least makes the right friends. For Ned, on the other hand, stubbornness is his tragic flaw, and his honorable refusal to play this Game of Thrones will lead him to die as Lord Snow. A question for you guys, do you think the scenes not in the book improve the writing on the show? Or do you think the show really needs George R. R. Martin's dialogue? Comment down below and tweet me your thoughts directly at EA Voss or follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars for updates on our videos. Now, if you like thinking deeply about your favorite shows like I do and impressing your friends with how smart you are, another channel besides this one that I can't recommend enough is Wisecrack. Specifically, their quick take series is great. Jared's video on the philosophy of Westworld and the way it uses music to tell a story is exactly the kind of thoughtful video essay we aim to do here. Definitely give it a watch. And subscribe to Wisecrack by clicking the link in the description below. And yeah, subscribe to us here at New Rockstars for more Game of Thrones analysis. We're gonna try to keep making these season one rewatch videos. No promises on release schedule because we cover a lot here. But you can help by liking and sharing this video around and by contributing to us on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our current donors, especially Lori Denning. All right, thanks for watching, bye.